Okay, I'm going to attempt to walk you through uh, a lesson on very brief overview of probability. Lesson number eight. So we're going to try to explain uh, what probability is, three different perspectives, some of the concepts of mutually exclusive versus independent events, conditional probability, what an expected value is, a little bit of some of the terms, difference between a densitivity function, a uh, density function, and a mass function. Uh, then we'll get into how you can use some of these things like a binomial distribution, a Poisson distribution, normal distribution, exponential, and other types, and what some of the basic business applications are and how you can use a random number generator to help us with business solutions. And the last thing we're going to introduce the uh, new add-on, which I'll add, is the Risk Solver platform, which will help us say, well, which one of these is really the best fit? So bear with me. I know this probably sounds a little complicated, but so probability is basically the uh, successful outcomes divided by total possible. So if I flip a coin and I want heads, well, there's one way heads can come up and there's two total possible. So the odds of getting a heads is one half. If I roll a dice, the odds of getting a one is one sixth and so on. Successful outcomes divided by total possible. But there are three ways to look at this. I, there's a classical way, which is the typical roll the dice or flip the coin, where the outcomes are all known, so it's relatively easy to calculate. Um, there's a second way, and that's to use uh, some raw data, and this is primarily what we're going to use in business analytics, where I get a relative frequency. In other words, I might have repair times, data set that I use to do my predictions. The last one is a subjective way. That's a way to be, uh, look based on experts' opinions, like to pick who's going to win the national championship or to make uh, stock market projections. I don't have data, but I have expert opinions and judgments. Now, just as some background, because we're going to use dice a lot in this example, and if you're not familiar with dice, uh, this just gives you over here the probability of, if I roll two dice, and I sum up the uh, outcomes of the two, the probability of getting a total of two is 136, and that's because there's only one way to do it. I get a one on the first roll and a one on the second. And then it's interesting, three, there are actually two ways, so that's 236 on down, and actually the most likely total is, is a total of seven, which is 636. Um, that's just, I wanted to give you some background because we'll use this a lot in a lot of the examples. Um, let's talk a little bit about mutually exclusive events, what those are. Those are uh, the probability of rolling two dice, a one, or let's say 11 or a 12. Mutually exclusive are where no events are in common. So I can't roll both an 11 and a 12 at the same time. I either roll an 11 or a 12. They both can't happen. So the probability of getting a 11 or a 12 is simply the probability of getting an 11, which is 3, three out of 36, plus the probability of getting a 12, which is 2 out of 36. Add the two together, and the probability is 536. Now, if they're not mutually exclusive, let's take another example. What's the probability of rolling an 11 or an odd number? Well, if we think about it, you know, the probability of getting an 11 is 336. The probability of getting an odd number is basically one half or 1836. But we got to be careful because we've double counted because 11 is in both sets. So we have to subtract out that double count. Otherwise, if you think about it, if I said the probability of getting a, a 3, 5, 7, 9, 11 or an odd number, if I didn't subtract out for the double counting, I would have a 100% probability. And we know that's not true. It's a 50-50% that would get the odd ones. So there it is for non-mutually exclusive. You can't just add the probabilities together. You've got to add the probabilities and then basically subtract out the double count, uh, which is called uh, the probability that both events happen. So you've got mutually exclusive, 
and non-mutual exclusive. Mutual exclusive is where uh, they have uh, no events or in common. Non-mutually exclusive is where they have events or outcomes that are in common. Okay, the next concept is a concept called independent events. And independent events is where what happens on the first event doesn't change or alter, has no effect on the probability of the next event. So assuming we have fair dice and fair coins, the probability of each event is independent. There's a one in six chance I roll a one or a two or a three, no matter what. And if I have independent events, if I want to see what are the odds of rolling a six and then exactly a four, it's one sixth times one six, which is called the multiplication rule. Uh, so one six times one six, it's one in 36 and I'll roll exactly a six and a four on the next one. That's why the odds of getting a total of two is one in 36 because I have to roll a one on the first one and I have to roll a one on the second one. So that's the concept of independent events. Now, if they're not independent, then I've got something what's called conditional probability. Conditional probability means, you know, what's happened before is going to change things. So let's say the example of here is, let's say I roll two dice. What's the probability of getting a total of eight? Well, the probability of rolling, getting an eight is 536. We can go back and look it up, but trust me, it's 536. But then if I said, well, what if you knew on the first roll of the dice that it was a one? Well, if we knew that we had a one on the first roll of the dice, then the probability of getting a total of eight is zero. Because the highest we can roll on the second dice is a six and a one and a six. So conditional probability, and I'm not going to go through the exact equation. We can, we can, we can read that in the book. But conditional probability is just the concept that Sometimes, if I know a prior event, it changes the probability. So in this example, because I know I rolled a one on the first dice, I know it's impossible for me to get a total of eight. It can't happen, right? So the condition is going to change the probability of my future events. And this comes in very, very handy in like uh, marketing, which we'll show you an example of once we get into some of the Excel examples. Some quick terms that the book talks about is a random variable. All that means is I can put an X in there. I can say, well, don't just tell me the odds of once I have a, it's kind of like algebra. Once I have a function, I can have a probability distribution function and I can solve for any X or any random variable. Now there's discrete random variables. That just means they can be counted like dice, one, two, three, four, five. And there's continuous, which is an example is like time. Now if it's continuous, it's called a densitivity uh, function. If it's discrete, it's called a mass. Don't worry about it too much. Uh, the other word they use is a cumulative distribution. That just means you add them all up. You'll see in a few minutes in Excel, if you use, if you use true, that means the probability of X or less. If you use false, it's just the probability of that value of X, which will become more clear once we do some examples. So let's talk briefly about some applications in real life, and then we'll talk about some Excel examples. So I don't know if anybody's an investor, but there's a modern uh, investment portfolio theory which uses uh, statistics and probability a lot. What they do is they add up the expected value, which is uh, on different portfolios. And then they, what they have here is the expected vol volatility. Well, I'll show you in a few minutes. This is nothing more than the mean, and this is nothing more than the standard deviation. And what they do is they plot different portfolios. And what it'll allow you to understand is uh, what's the right mix of different stocks and bonds and stuff that'll give you the highest rate of return for the least amount of risk, which is basically what you want. Uh, we'll talk about a Poisson distribution. Here's a typical one. You use this a lot for staffing. So a Poisson distribution is used when you have, uh, let's say I knew two babies were born in the hospital on average every hour. How many nurses should I have on staff to be covered for 98% of the events? 
So let's get into some of the Excel, and I don't know that, let me try to move this guy. Oh, that didn't work so well. Let me try to move, oh, what am I moving here? Oh. Sorry. There we go. All right. Um, sorry about that. Let's talk about Let's talk about uh, let's talk about conditional probability for a moment and how I set this up in Excel. A lot of this, so conditional remember is a probability of if I know one thing, uh, the events will change a little bit. Here are different responses, different age people, and if their preference was brand one, brand two, brand three. Now, what I've done is I've uh, sort of rearranged the data, something you oftentimes do. I just said, you know, count if. So uh, if they're over 30, it's a 1. If they're under 30, it's a 0. I just put in this function right here. And then I wanted to break out which brand they liked, so I just said uh, count if. So there's brand 1, brand 2. And by putting those in the columns like that, it was allowing me to do a simple uh, pivot table you see down here where I could see, remember, 1 is over 30, 0 is under 30, and this is the different brands they liked, and I just added a sum field here that just said, so all I did there is I just went in, uh, I'll show you the steps, I just went up here to my uh, options, and I said calculations, and I said uh, add those up for me. Uh, if you think about the probability of a person liking brand 1, it's 4, Four people liked brand one out of a total of 36. So 30% 30 of the people or 31% of the people like brand one. But now what if I said, what if I told you the person was under 30, right? So now I basically don't have to worry about this. I'm only worried about, I'm not worried about the total anymore. I'm only worried about these people that are zeros, all these people that are under 30. Well, for them, they will like brand M four out of five or 80%. Now the exact formula that's in the book is uh, down here, but you can see basically all you're doing is you're saying, well, if I know, just like we did with the uh, uh, dice example, well, if I know I'm only talking about people under 30, all I have to do is look at this row right here. And I know people under 30 like brand number one, four out of five times versus the overall is four out of 13. Um, here was just simply the uh, uh, remember I showed you the stocks and the bonds I just simply had the math had them take the standard deviation in the mean which is easy to do because the data tells us and I just plotted it over here and you basically see that's very close to the curve they have, but that's what modern uh, portfolio theory uses. Expected value, they give a good example of neat deal, no deal show. So if I had five cases, I just take the probability, it's uh, five cases, it's one fifth for each one, the money. I simply multiply the probability times the money, add up the expen ex expected values, 212. Poisson distribution. So let's let's think that on average two babies are born every hour. How much staff do I need? Well, I said let's assume there's zero babies. One, two. Now this is simply the. I just go up and I do give me the function Poisson distribution. I say how many babies? I say on average we have two. And the true means that I want a cumulative. Uh, probability. So this means the probability of zero or less, one or less, two or less, three or less, four or less, five or less, six or less. So the probability that I have uh, six or, or less is 99.5. So you know the odds that I have seven babies in an hour is less than one half of one percent. Now you can also go into the Poisson distribution and say false and that'll give you the probability of each one of these uh, individual uh, occurrences at one baby two baby and notice it's cumulative this number is the sum of that and that okay so that's a Poisson distribution and 
what it's used for is where it's oftentimes used in business for staffing problems where you say, uh, or queuing problems. How do I know that I have enough staff if on average two babies are born every hour? Binomial distribution, that's where I have, I use that where I have a true or a false or a yes or a no. So I use foul shooting. Let's say I'm an 80% foul shooter and I go, I get fouled on a three point shot. Uh, how many of those am I going to make? Well, I just do binomial distribution. I said the odds of getting zero is right there. Uh, I'm taking, it'll ask me how many trials. I'm taking three trials. What's the percentage on each one? 80%. Again, true gives me a cumulative distribution. False gives me the odds of each one. So the odds of me making exactly one out of three foul shots is 0.096. The odds that I'll make one foul shot or less is 0.104. Same thing for two. And you can see there's a little over 50% chance that I'll make exactly three, but there's a 100% chance that I'll make three or less. Uh, here's the use of the norm disk tool. Um, so I calculated my Z score, which as you remember is my test score minus my standard deviation. Uh, my, my test score minus my mean divided by my standard deviation. And then once I have that, I can use my norm disk. And again, I wanted cumulative distribution. So these are test scores. Uh, the probability that somebody scored an 82 or below is 51%. Uh, 94 or below is 80%. Probability, etc. So norm disk is used for normal distributions, normal bell-shaped curve. Also might have an exponential curve. Uh, that I'd simply use... Uh, let's say the average car, this is used lots of times for warranty purposes because you have early life failure. If things are going to fail, they tend to fail early in life. So I can use the average car 1,500 miles or hours before the engine breaks down. That would be a 45,000 mile warranty. I can simply put in uh, exponential distribution, how many hours. Uh, my mu is 1 divided by how many, you know, the odds of it breaks down any single hour is 1 divided by 15,000. And I say true to get a cumulative uh, uh, distribution. So the odds that the car will break down after 1,100 hours or approximately 33,000 miles is about 51%. A random number generator is very easy. You just put rand. It'll give you a number between 0 and 1. If I want a number between 0 and 100, I just multiply by 100. So if I want, you know, give me random numbers between 0 and 100, I put random in here, multiply it by 100. I got them from 0 to 100. Now, the last thing is, so we've got all these different distributions. We got Poisson, we got binomial, we got exponential, we got normal. How do we know which one of those curves best fits the data we have? Well, that's where you come up with a thing called a goodness of fit. It's very similar to your correlation coefficient for linear functions. Goodness of fit, you've got a couple of tools like chi-square, etc. But we've got a tool to add in, which we'll have a separate video on, called Risk Solver Platform, which all comes free with the book, which will allow us to put the data in there to say which one of these statistical or probability tools, which one of these curves does my data best fit? I, I can take a pretty good educated guess by doing a frequency distribution curve and looking at it, but in real life, you're really going to want to put it into one of the risk solvers and say, which one of these distributions does my model fit best? Sorry for the long video. Hope it helps. Any questions, let me know.